certain things got lost. And um, I don't quite know where it went, but I think at some point it resurfaced and everyone thought, no, that won't be the real hoggle here. No, there's no way it's going to be. But it was. And I think it got, if my memory serves me right, without checking online, I think, my memory, I think it got lost in some shipping. Uh, it was in sort of like a, uh, it was going from A to B somewhere, and it got lost, and nobody kind of came to pick it up. <laughs> Everyone forgot about it. Um, it's a little bit like after Dark Crystal was uh, completed and Jim Henson started on Labyrinth. There was a period when um, it's like, right, oh, well, we're done. Jim decided he wasn't going to do any more Dark Crystal. That was it. It was only the one Dark Crystal. So he thought, oh, well, um, well, he decided. He didn't, he didn't have the room to store the molds, because there's so many molds for Dark Crystal, destroy them all. So all the original Dark Crystal molds were sledgehammered and cut to pieces, and um, he didn't want anyone stealing them, because he didn't want people sort of casting things out of them, so they were all destroyed. Back in the day when um, people collecting these sort of things was never considered. So. <laughs> So yeah, sadly, that all disappeared. It doesn't exist anywhere. All of that stuff. So, <laughs> so, but um, in the same same idea, um, so much is thrown away into skips at the end of a movie. I mean, they just throw things into into um, dumpsters when everything's done. Just amazing work and art and puppets. And just they don't want them. It costs too much to store. Throw them away. <laughs> And now the prop store of London sells them for big bucks. Oh yes, Brandon, yes, Brandon Allinger, and yeah, the prop store. They, they, they decided that they, that was their passion. They like collecting screen-used props, and uh, they've turned it into a very good business, I think. So, hmm. yes. so do you know whenever they made the Dark Crystal show, like did they work with some of the same artists to do that, or? Um, no, I wasn't work involved in Dark Crystal. I was on another project. Uh, initially, it was being built in Burbank, uh, in California, and then the puppets went out for rehearsals and rebuild in London. Um, so there's like two sections of build for Dark Crystal, the TV shows, as far as I know. They used uh, one of the interesting um, um, uh, creative inputs was Brian and Wendy Froud's son, Toby, who was Toby in Labyrinth, yeah. um, became the puppet supervisor for <laughs> the Gelflings. And obviously coordinated with his mom and dad about getting these puppets built. And uh, I think um, Wendy came in and did some work. She didn't want to really focus on the Gelflings because she had she'd already done that so 40 years before. But she did some of the, um, just like, fun, quick-made puppets that, um, that would just be one-offs and absolutely adored doing that. And of course, Brian did a lot of des re new designs for it. So the original creative vision from Brian Froud was, was um, embraced and um, Brian was, was on that film, uh, on, on the TV series. So, um, and that was, it was great. It was, it was really nice to, to see that. But typically, the puppeteers, not, I think Louise Gold, she played the, the gourmet Skeksis. And she was back again working on that, but pretty much everyone else, they were all new puppeteers. A lot of my friends, because it was all filmed in England, I now live in Burbank, so I wasn't there, so, um, but they, they had fun to relive the Dark Crystal after hearing stories from me <laughs> when I worked on it when I was 20. <laughs> Um, the, the, the main one that I kept that the screen used was um, the Some Fun Now um, Audrey 2 puppet because I built and performed that for Frank Oz, the director, and for Lyle Conway, uh, anim animatronic supervisor. Um, because um, most of Audrey 2, well, all the other versions of Audrey 2 were mechanical, they were, had cables to control all the functions of, of the puppet. But for the actual of being able to pull on uh, Rick Moranis's finger and make it look realistic, they decided they needed a hand puppet. And they didn't have really a puppet maker on, on the crew, or certainly didn't have one that was available. So uh, Lyle asked me, and I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. So I got in at 5 a.m. in the mornings and worked through till we started rehearsing at 9. 
and in those hours I, I assembled this hand puppet. Eventually got to puppeteer it on, on the movie and um, at the end, as, as a gift and as a thank you, uh, Frank Wells and Lyle Conway gave me that puppet to keep. So, so that was one that I was, I was given. Um, and um, while we were working on um, Roger Rabbit, we got a few of the props. I got um, uh, the uh, ink and paint club menus, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, so over the course of the, the years, I've had sort of props and, and bits and pieces from them, but as far as a screen use puppet, it's Audrey, Audrey Tooze is my favourite. So. Other questions, or I guess I could. Um, yes. Um, not a question, a comma. I was doing some online research about Hoggle, and yes. as of December of 2021, they were saying um, that the uh, Alabama Unclaimed Baggage uh, Center actually owns them and has them on display. Alabama. Wow, that's brilliant. I love that. That's just excellent. Wow. Yep. Yeah. The internet knows everything. Yes, that's true. Yes. Oh, well, that's fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, brilliant. Poor guy. yeah, they found his head and no yeah. one ever claimed it. No one ever claimed it. Yeah, they said crazy. it's not owned by Hanson's estate or anything. Wow. Yeah. That's nuts. Well, you'd think it would be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow. There you go. Oh, it might, must have gone off for some kind of exhibition or display or something and everybody <laughs> forgot about it. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, yeah, well the, um, so, yes, I've been doing this 44 years in films, mm -hmm. and uh, my most recent film is uh, Coyote vs. Acme. Mm -hmm. It's a Warner Brothers movie, and the premise is um, Wiley Coyote um, is suing the Acme Corporation <laughs> with all the failed products that he's bought over the years. And so, um, but he's doing it so that he can try and get hold of the Roadrunner, because he still hasn't got the Roadrunner. So it stars Will Forte, who's absolutely brilliant. He's hilarious. He's really good. And uh, and yeah, so uh, we filmed that in Albuquerque, which was on locations a lot, which was really great because it really felt like the environment that Coyote would be in. And um, in early discussions, the, the production was saying, well, um, Coyote doesn't speak. And this is a live action film that has uh, live actors with an animated coyote. Well, what are we going to do about coyote? And um, my producer friend, Chris Tafaria, said, I have the solution. It's called Dave Barclay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he called me up and, and I, I sort of gave him my pitch as how I felt um, coyote could be represented for, for the live action part um, with a puppet, so a full size puppet. So Chris seemed to think that was a great idea. So I made a prototype. And everyone loved the prototype. So um, when they got the green light, I built various different versions of him, uh, of Coyote, so that he could have different arms and different legs and different bodies, different heads. Um, but the main puppeteering head had mechanisms to make his cheeks smile and frown, and his eyes frown and go sad. So the combination of those two, which were direct linkage mechanisms that I could control with my right hand, um, I could give him different emotional beats and acting, because that we needed Coyote to act silently in front of all the actors. So, um, so that's what I did. I was on my knees every day, <laughs> holding up this Coyote <laughs> puppet, dressed in black, and um, representing Coyote, um, performing on set every day. So, which was it was absolute joy. It was really great, and everybody was was so supportive and, and, and really enjoyed Coyote being there. It was it was fantastic. It was a great experience, and. Um, my friend Keith, who's the animation director, is doing an, it's just completed an amazing job on the animation. I think it's really some of the best, like, because um, it is actually computer animation, CG animation, but it looks just like the original cartoon animation. So it holds up beautifully on the big screen, and it's just amazing. So I think it's going to be a great movie. Um, we're waiting to hear about a, a, an actual final release date. Because I think um, Warner Brothers has just gone through some um, executive changes, so uh, the pathways of uh, so some people have gone, and so they're, they're trying to work out when when they can get the uh, release date. So 
Um, but yeah, keep an eye out for Coyote versus Acne Acid, because I think it's going to be brilliant. So. <laughs> it's getting high 90s in, in the test screening, so yeah. it, should, it should be good. It should be fun. <laughs> And it's nice because it's like I'm still puppeteering. I mean, Yoda, I was the kid, and, and I'm the granddad on Coyote. <laughs> <laughs> still doing the same stuff, with, and just still loving it though. I mean, that's the thing. I just so enjoyed being on the film set again. It was really good because we had the break from COVID. Everyone had the break from COVID, and um, so no. Not too hot now, I was fine. I think we we got the good, the right timing. Yeah, because we started sort of. I think mid-March, so we wasn't we didn't get too hot. We were out in the desert for a while, and that was pretty blistering. So um, yes, I, I, I wore sort of like more um, sand-colored clothes rather than <laughs> black because I would have just I think I might have passed out from eating too much dinner. So, but no, it's it's so lovely, and yeah, the, the actors were so supportive of uh, of the puppeteer being there. So because that's not always the case. Some some actors don't necessarily get on with the puppets. Um, I, I, did, um, I did Baron Munchausen, and, um, which was an amazing film, and um, a very sort of quirky film. But the, the, um, John Neville, the lead actor for Baron Munchausen, um, it, it's, um, I had to take his soul out of his mouth, and so that death had come along, I was playing um, a skeletal figure of death with these mechanical skeletal hands, I had to reach in and take out, and it was a little light rig that my friend Dave McCall had made, and it was basically attached to the, uh, the shutter speed of the camera. So it was it was flashing away while while we were just a bit like a, a flash from a camera. It was flashing away while we were doing it, but it looks like a pure solid light on film. Really clever. So but I had to pick, pick this unit out and take it away, and um, Terry Gilliam was the director. He said, "Oh, that's great. That's fantastic. Great." And, and John Nell says, oh, first it was children, and then animals, and now I'm upstaged by a bloody puppet. <laughs> <laughs> and I took that as a great compliment. You know, so. <laughs> so yeah, so he was, he was having, oh, well, he had such a hard time on the movie because it's so exhausting for him, and it's such a crazy movie. But yeah, um, yeah, so every once in a while, the actors uh, weren't quite so supportive. Bob Hoskins on the other side from Roger Rabbit was the most supportive actor you could imagine. He was just so amazing. And, um, and that was another wonderful film where, because it's interesting, you, there's two different ways of um, remembering the film. It's how the days that you make it and then seeing the final movie when it's complete. Now sometimes you can work on a film that you think is really lovely and you look at it going, oh, it wasn't very good. Or the opposite, you, you work on a film that is quite miserable, and it's a great film. I think nearly all my films were great to work on, and they look great when, you, when I saw them. So Roger Rabbit was one of those where it was fantastic to work on, and when we saw it, it was just as fantastic as the experience of working on it. So, um, so yeah, it's, 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 a lovely, it's a lovely experience being able to sort of bring these characters to life, and, um, and then go and see how they look when, for everybody else. But, of course, I'm never going to see it like you guys do. I'm going to be checking, oh yeah, no, that, that eye blink was in the wrong place. <laughs> they should have chosen the tape before, because the tape before, the eye blink was perfect. <laughs> so yeah, so. puppeteers are very much control freaks, where you want to get everything right. And that's why I think Frank's directing on Little Shop of Horrors was perfect, because he made sure it was. And that film is like, I think it's excellent. So very proud of that. I'm proud of, all, I think, all the films that I've worked on. So. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, just and, it, and some of them are, are like working with Muppets. It's like working with old friends, and you just get back together again. Sometimes, oh, haven't seen you for ten years, and then you get back. We did the Jason Segel film a few years ago in Hollywood, and it was lovely. I just got to catch up with all my old puppeteer friends, and uh, and yeah, and just just have a blast, just just enjoy it. So, and and sometimes that's nice when you're just in, because um, I typically just go in and assist and double for the Muppet characters. I'm not a lead Muppet. Um, so, um, so that's nice, there's no responsibility. Rather than when I'm animatronic effects supervised and I've got to make sure the puppets look right and the performances look right, a lot more responsibility. So again, each job has its own benefits and, and um, I love them all. So.
Do you still keep in touch with them, like Brian Henson and Frank Oz? I haven't seen them for a while, actually. No, no, not 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 for a while. Um, I have seen some of the other Muppet performers more recently, but not not Brian or Frank. So. Um, I, I almost bumped into Frank a little while, just a, a few months ago, but we just, wrong timing, so. Because I think Frank's in New York, so and I'm, in, yeah. I'm in LA, so. We won't, we, unless we set up a meeting, so. Which I, I guess I should do, I should, yeah, okay. catch up. It was because of Frank and giving me uh, the chance to uh, take over Yoda for those, those two weeks that launched my career, so I've got him to thank for everything. Right, yes, I, I did say a little bit of that, but I, I can um, be a bit more specific. Um, uh, being second generation puppeteer, I wanted to um, not do my parents' traditional theatrical work, I wanted to get into TV and movies. And so I started building my own prosthetic makeups and that sort of thing. I did some home movies. I think I did a parody of the Million Dollar Man versus the Dalek <laughs> with the Golden Gun. And um, the Million Dollar Man had really bad um, bionics and a terrible rubber hand and a dodgy eye. <laughs> and, uh, so I did that as a silly film. And then I made a full-size Dalek. I did, my friend and uh, my friend James and I decided to make a full-size Dalek uh, when I was 14. And so built the Dalek in, in my back garden. And so we filmed it. So. Um, so yeah, sort of really was interested in filmmaking and, and doing that sort of thing. Um, but the, the, the direct line, the, the specific line into Star Wars was I worked at Hamley's Toy Store in London doing a summer job, selling toy puppets, the puppets I used to um, puppeteer when I was a kid. Um, and Mark Hamill came in and Mark said um, he wanted to buy a whole bunch of puppets and have a custom Darth Vader string puppet made. So he commissioned me to make an 18-inch carved Darth Vader, which, when it was finished, he invited me along to the studios to present it to him. Um, he said, oh, I'm sure you'd like to meet Stuart Freeborn. I said, love to, because Stuart was the makeup artist, and I knew all about Stuart. He was one of my heroes. Went up to meet him. I had brought my portfolio. I was very sensible. <laughs> Showed him my portfolio of all the work that I'd done. And uh, a week later, Stuart offered me a job working for him on what became Yoda. <laughs> And because I had done the makeups, I'd done the sculpting, um, I did an old age makeup of myself, and I did a, a copy of famous Dick Smith's 121-year-old <laughs> makeup on Dustin Hoffman from Little Big Man. And so I had all these, all this work. So I, and I had the puppets and some stop motion figures and some models um, and just character sketches and everything. There was just enough for him to say, oh yeah, yeah you, you can wash out the foams and you can trim off the edges and everything, I'll, I'll have you in and work. So, yeah, so I had just enough um, skills already at age 19 to be uh, a viable trainee. And that's it, that just took off then. Snowball from that point, and s snowball's slowing down a little bit now, but it's still rolling. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hate to cut you short, but they're telling me your photo op is uh, about ready to start oh, right. here, oh my so. God. Oh, well, I haven't, I haven't even brought you. Yeah, no. I forgot about Yoda. Let's get Yoda out. But hey, everybody.